So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Ask the Experts session focused on preparing for your first role in a post-COVID environment. Um, this is one of many professional development opportunities we are offering through the Capital Collab in the month of April. Um, so be sure to check out the events that will be happening throughout the month on the capitalcollab.com page under the Credential Month tab. So before we jump in and introduce our panelists, I'm going to give a brief overview of the Capital Collab and our vision for the region for those of you that may not be familiar with, the, with who we are and the work that we do. So we are a regional collaboration of employers and educators from Baltimore to Richmond, working to build the most diverse digital tech workforce in the country. We accomplished this by working with both employers and educators in the region to align what you learn in the classroom to the skills these employers are looking for in their workforce. So you'll see on the screen here, the employer partners come from a wide variety of industries. Um, in addition, we have a wide range of university partners that are also implementing this digital tech credential program offered through the Capital Collab. This credential leads to a digital badge, and this is the signal to employers that you have those skills that they're looking for in their workforce. Each of our university partners through Capital Collab designates the courses that are required to, to make up the credential so that if you have questions on how that looks on your campus and what the requirements are, you can go to your university to um, discuss you know, how to earn the digital tech credential through your campus. There are several ways to get involved. One is um, by just attending this panel session today. But joining the Capital Collab also allows you to gain insights into the job market and hiring in this national capital region. If you have questions, uh, we have a wonderful student engagement associate, Tasha Washington, who's available at the email address that's on the screen, collab at greaterwashingtonpartnership.com. Um, she is happy to answer any questions that you have um, about Collab or point you to the resources on your university's campus about the credential. So with that, I am going to ask our participants to join me here um, and I will give a quick uh, overview of our fantastic um, panelists. So we have Stacey Fowler. She serves as the Director of Employer Services for GW's Center for Career Services. She strategically designs, complements, and expands outreach to employers, bringing increased opportunities to students and increased awareness of GW's students to the domestic and global marketplace. Prior to joining GW, she served in communications and recruitment roles at Bloomberg, Northrop Grumman, PBS, and the US Department of Energy. She holds a master's degree from Georgetown University and a bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia. So thank you for joining us, Stacey. Uh, Lori Logan Bennett has worked in higher education for over 20 years and is currently serving as the Assistant Vice President for Career Services at Towson University. She is past president of the Maryland Career Development Association and the Maryland Career Consortium, and is also a Gallup certified strengths coach. Throughout her career, Lori has been committed to preparing career ready college students and connecting the region's future workforce with employers and opportunities. Thank you, Lori, for joining us. And Anita Taylor is the Director of Career Services at the Virginia Commonwealth University College of Engineering. She's been with VCU for over 20 years and has been at the College of Engineering since 2006. The Engineering Career Services team manages student professional development, the college's internship program, and the Engineering Co-op program. The department also manages a portfolio of corporate relations for the College of Engineering. So thank you, Anita. Thank you to all the panelists for being here. As you can see, we have a rock star crew with us to talk on all things hiring in a post COVID environment. So I think I will jump right in uh, to the questions for the panel. Um, and Stacey, maybe I will start with you. There's been so much um, anticipation about what returning to the workplace will look like in this post COVID environment. Um, and we know the future of work has shifted dramatically just over these last 12 months. 
So what are some key things students should keep in mind as they are exploring internship and full-time opportunities? So thank you. I want to thank you, Deb, for having me today and just to discuss this topic. I think I'd start off by saying that students, um, whether you're currently enrolled or graduating in a few more weeks, to continue to look for opportunities as much as one can and don't be discouraged. I think perseverance is key um, during this point in time. And when searching for both full-time and internships in the next six months, be prepared to join an organization virtually. Um, and the potential to be hybrid perhaps later this year or even a year from now. Many of the logistical hurdles that we heard organizations saw in the spring of 2020 in terms of onboarding interns and full-time staff have been ironed out. And so many employers have indicated that now they feel comfortable um, bringing on employers virtually. And then we even saw yesterday that Salesforce announced plans to bring folks to their San Francisco office in May but employees will have to prove that they've been vaccinated. So just pay attention to what's happening in your local area and with specific employers and be sure to look for these notations in the job description or even ask during the interview. I mean, people are having these conversations, so. That's great, thank you. Um, as a follow-up to that, Lori, so as, as we see things shifting, as Stacy mentioned, um, for students that won't start looking for opportunities until the fall, should they expect the recruiting processes to go back to normal at that point? So as a blanket statement, I would say probably not. Um, I think it's going to depend a lot on where you are geographically, what institution you're at, the employers that you're interested in. Um, I think what you'll probably see is sort of a hybrid approach. Um, so some employers, um, their, their plans may allow for complete on-campus recruitment activity um, in terms of fairs or on-campus interviews. Um, others may prefer to continue the virtual approach to recruiting. And you may find some who maybe will participate Participate in smaller in-person events, but leave the larger kind of recruitment events to the virtual space. So I think um, the need to be flexible and to um, recognize that folks will be sort of approaching the fall in a variety of different ways will be important. Um, and to, to kind of keep that in mind as you search out opportunities and connect with your, your university's career centers going forward. Such, such great insight and advice. Um, Anita, I'm, I'm interested in your perspective and, and what you've seen um, with many employers shifting to this virtual internship and employment and, and hybrid um, focus. Have you found that there are fewer opportunities for students? And what advice would you give to students on ways to find opportunities and openings? Oh, I think you might be on mute. And I owe each of you a dollar. <laughs> That's how that works. So again, Deb, thank you so much for letting me be a part of this. This is great. Um, right now in our space, which is engineering and computer science, things are moving like gangbusters right now. So um, I think the issue that we do see is that A, students don't know. They're assuming that the jobs aren't out there when they are. And also, kind of making that connection for students that we used to make in person, right? We used to have employers come on campus, but now nobody is on campus. So we're doing everything virtually. So that level of connection isn't there. Um, and so those are the things that we're seeing, but I still think that, you know, it's not too late to keep looking. It's not, it's not like for employers, all the good students are not taken. Um, you know, this is prime time to kind of get after it, find your internship for the summer or your full-time role for after graduation, and just really take advantage of everything that's in front of you. I think right now, um, I feel as though a lot of our students are just really burned out on kind of the virtual environment, but you have to realize also that's the only way the employers have to make a personal connection. So if your priority is to land a job or to land an internship, you need to be there. You need to be at the six o'clock session, even though you're really tired. You need to be at the lunch and learn 
on Zoom, even though you've got a homework assignment, because those are the opportunities where, honestly, a lot of students aren't going to be there. So you have an opportunity to really make yourself stand out and shine. Um, but those are the opportunities to make the connections. Um, so every time there's an employer that you're interested in who's recruiting on campus virtually, you need to be there. Um, also, students need to look at the employer web pages and also we use handshake so in the employer profile for handshake a lot of them are doing their own virtual events but on their site so they'll have you know our company's career day or virtual day is set up on this site and everybody from this school needs to go there so you know you need to really really have a plan and you need to be probably more aggressive in this environment than you had to be in the previous few years. Um, but the fact is that the people who are really going after it are gonna make it happen um, because the opportunities are there. And just like Lori said, now that things are kind of opening up, um, we're gonna see more and more opportunities. And then finally, I'll just say network. We say it all the time. But especially now, um, when you aren't able to make a personal connection with somebody, you've got to work that network. You've got to find the alum. You've got to find the people who can help you. That, that's great. I, I, I want to hone in on that networking piece because I think you're, you're spot on. It's, it's so important. And Lori, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, this virtual world and how that's changed networking. Um, you know, there's, there's no more or fewer in-person events, if any. Um, so is it still possible to build those meaningful connections? And you know, what, what are some suggestions for networking in this environment? Yeah, so I would say absolutely it's um, possible. And to echo what Anita said, absolutely it's important and really critical. So in terms of managing it in this virtual environment, I think what you'll find is that across the board and on both sides, folks are more comfortable these days than um, if we would have asked this question a year ago in networking virtually and remotely um, because we've, we've been there and we've been doing it, uh, maybe not from a, a networking lens, but in terms of communicating anyway in these environments. Um, so I would say it's certainly possible um, and again, folks are going to be a little bit more comfortable with it, so that might make it easier. Um, I think there are going to be lots of ways to connect virtually, and that's really all networking is, is building and making connections. Um, so it could be easy, just like following an individual and organization that you're interested in, um, or it could be liking or commenting on somebody that you are hoping to network with um, in LinkedIn, for instance. It could be direct messaging them. It could be um, setting up actual times to connect um, for more in-depth conversations, um, whether that's over the phone or in virtual meetings. So there are gonna be a variety of ways that you can look to build those connections, lots of tools to use to build those connections. So I mentioned LinkedIn as being a critical tool, um, but there could also be other career management systems, for instance, like those who are at Handshake schools, um, the opportunity to, to connect with folks on Handshake. Um, if your institution, if your school has a mentoring platform or a mentoring program in place, that's the perfect place to plug in because generally you're gonna be connected to to folks who have already agreed to kind of serve in that volunteer mentor role. So it's a real easy in. Um, our school, Towson University, we utilize the People Grow platform, branded the Tiger Mentor Network. So if you're not familiar with your school's mentoring network or if they have one, connect with their career center, they'll definitely be able to direct you. And then good old fashioned tools like phone and email. <laughs> not everything has to be Zoom, right? So um, you'd be able to, to utilize all those tools to conduct the networking activity. And then finally, I'd just like to add that it's important to think about networking really broadly. So it's not just um, you know, the, the person that would hire me that I want to network with. Um, it's also networking with other students that are in your classes and in your program, faculty um, that you're interacting with. Um, I already mentioned alumni is a really great group to, to build your network with, um, but professional associations, um, you know, every profession has them. There are great ways for students to plug into these professional associations um, to, to gain exposure to folks who are doing the work that they want to do. Um, many of those have mentoring programs in place, so um, checking those out is important. And then finally, just thinking about everybody that you know is in your network. 
Um, they may not be doing what you want to do in your industry or in your profession, but um, going back to that six degrees of separation concept, they all have their own networks. And so they may be able to connect you to folks. So just think about networking broadly, the variety of tools that you have, um, and really pull on that comfort that you have with interacting in the online environment to maybe give you a little confidence in moving forward. That's great. Thank, thank you. Um, I, I want to shift a little bit and go back to Anita, um, something that you mentioned about just, you know, being aggressive and it's a competitive environment right now. I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about, um, you know, what a student can do to differentiate themselves, knowing that, you know, we're all in a virtual world right now. So how can they differentiate themselves um, when looking for an opportunity? Right. Well, thank you so much for asking that. So. I think, again, um, part of it is your brand now isn't the uh, meeting that you had in person with, you know, whoever it is that you want to get in front of. Your brand is now whatever people see over Zoom and what you actually share as far as your LinkedIn profile and your resume. So I always start with making sure that your LinkedIn profile is up to date that um, that it's actually conveying your skills and your projects and your accomplishments in the way that they need to be conveyed in order to achieve the goal that you might have, whether it's an internship or a full-time role, um, that your resume is in absolutely wonderful shape because the way you get the interview is your resume gets through the first pass, right? So your resume has to be in good shape. Um, just like Lori said, and I think Stacy mentioned as well, just make sure that you're connecting and networking with your career services staff, alumni, faculty. Um, you know, they can always help you. There, we have connections, and we're always willing to share those connections. And remember also that as you're setting up these meetings, as you are doing informational interviews, as you are meeting people and trying to establish your own professional network, that in a virtual environment, your brand is what people see. So, you know, when I'm doing a career advising session with you and you're in your room and I see your cat on your bed, I can deal, okay? But you have to ask yourself, is that the brand that you want when you first are introduced to somebody that may or may not be able to help you get a job? I will leave that to the student to answer, but there are, um, I mean, just something as simple as these background filters that we have. You know, it, it's all okay. Just throw up a background filter and call it a day. Um, you know, it's so much easier than trying to explain away everything that people are seeing because it just distracts people and they're just looking in the background anyway. So you may as well just filter it out. Um, I think that that can go um, a long way as well into, um, into just your image. Your professional image is so important at this point. And that's, what's, that's what people are going to remember. That's, that's fantastic advice. Um, you know, and I think all of you represent, you know, universities in the region that have these uh, services where, where students can go and get help finding resources and, and get this advice. Um, Stacy, I was wondering if you could maybe give a little insight into GW's resources that and other campuses might have similar resources and, and what students can do, like where, where do they start if they don't even know where to start? Yeah, I think you make a good point. I think all of the career centers, at least in this region, have the resources that are critical and valuable to students to use. Many of them are free. Um, I say most important at this moment in time is making an appointment with a career coach, counselor, or advisor. Um, during these sessions, you'll have the opportunity to ask about your resume, um, ask about the alumni mentoring platforms that Lori mentioned, how to approach your job search, what can you do next? Just even talk about your desires or your concerns, you know, how you're feeling at this point in your job search. Anita mentioned being aggressive using your university job board. So if it's handshake or simplicity, check daily, you know, don't just check once a week, continue to check opportunities are being posted. And I would say the most important thing I think at this point is also just 
mock interviews um, with your career center. It may be hard to find somebody to practice with, whether it's your family or friends who don't have time, or maybe just don't have any interest in hearing you sort of go back and forth, you know, with your interview um, practice. So that's what you can use your career, career center for. It can be recorded. You can see how you look, how you sound, um, critique, sort of make changes on how you're approaching the interview. And we've heard from many employers that even after the pandemic, virtual interviewing is gonna continue. So this is a skill set that you can be building now because it's not gonna go away. So it is a very valuable skill set to sort of get it, get, get perfect it now because it's gonna continue. That's that's great. So so I wonder, you know, once I've landed the job, once once I've gone through the interview process and I've landed the job, um, Am, am I done? Are there still resources that I can um, access on campuses? And maybe Anita, I'll, I'll toss that question to you. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, I think for all of these schools and for many schools in Virginia, Career Services is going to be here to help you for the long haul, right? So, you know, our philosophy is that we're gonna teach you strategies that you can apply throughout your career. However, if you want to be, if you want to change careers, if you want to change jobs and you are just not sure how to do that, we welcome you back. You can always come back and we'll walk you through that process. Um, so yes, absolutely. There are services there to help you. Um, but also, you know, once you're in an internship or you're hired into a new role, the truth is that most of the people in the company want to help you right? People are open to the conversation with the new person and everybody's going to say yes. So you may as well take advantage of that window of opportunity and meet as many people as you can because you never know who they know, again, networking and what they know that may come in handy for you later. So we had one student who went away on a co-op and kind of gamified this process over the course of her co-op, which was six months or something. She made it, it was her goal to meet four people, to have four meetings with people outside of her immediate team every every week or every two weeks or something. And, um, and she ended up exploring almost the entire operation uh, where she was doing her co-op. She met managers from all of these different areas. She became interested in another research opportunity. You just never know what's going to come of these conversations. So go ahead and take advantage of those. Um, also ask your supervisor to introduce you to others in the company or to other people in the industry. Um, to also see if you can accompany your supervisor to any meetings outside of the company, um, any calls that they're making, any conferences, especially with things virtual. It may not be as much of a burden on the company to pay for travel and everything. So you may be able to go to some industry conferences as well. All of those things are going to help make you feel like you're a part of the company and the organization, but also help you frame what your career could look like and give you a point of reference moving forward. That's great. And, and I really, um, I like how you're emphasizing it's it's your, you continue to build your network, even after you're in a position, um, whether that's inside the organization or through their connections. So that's, um, that's, that's great advice. Um, Lori, I think I'm going to toss the, the big one that always comes up always is social media. So not, not just for new grads, right? It's really anyone looking for a position. Um, Anita, I know you mentioned earlier, you know, building your personal brand um, that that also goes along with social media. So what would you take this opportunity to emphasize to anyone looking for a position about social media? So I think I would maybe apply sort of a sports lens to that question in terms of um, how you can be um, uh, defensive about your social media participation. 
um, an activity and how you can kind of go on the offense around your social media activity. So on the what you should do side, the offensive side, um, I think it might be helpful to take a step back and really change your perspective about social media usage in general in terms of, um, you know, this is a way for you not only to connect with individuals and maybe before um, or earlier that was, you know, friends, um, you know, maybe friends and family. And now how can you use social media to connect with professionals and to further your professional goals? Um, and so that change in perspective can really help you um, sort of apply a critical eye towards what activity you are engaging with um, on social media in particular. So thinking about how you can use social media to build your professional presence. Um, you know, LinkedIn is probably the, the most obvious tool for that. There are others, but that's a great place to start. So think about how on LinkedIn and any other platforms, um, you can start to frame how you want to be seen by potential employers. Um, you really take that step back and think about what it is you have to offer, um, the value add that you bring and how can you start to communicate that on these platforms. Um, you can, of course, use these platforms, too, on the offensive side to, to build and maintain connections. Um, you can follow organizations you're interested in. So those are some proactive steps that you can take. Um, but I would also um, let you know that you should you know, pay attention as you're building this professional presence online um, to how you're presenting yourself in terms of written communication. So grammar, spelling, you know, paying attention to those, not only in your posts, but any messaging that you're doing as well. So really start to think about the proactive steps and actions that you can take to get your professional presence built up um, in the social media platforms, LinkedIn and others. So you're applying that critical eye to the other platforms that you're on as well, Instagram, Facebook, whatever it might be. On the defensive side, it's a little bit about what should I do or what should I start thinking about um, to evaluate what's out there currently, um, you know, and how can I clean up what might be out there previously. Um, sort of assume that anything that's out there can be seen by an employer. Even if you've set your privacy settings, um, you don't want to necessarily rely on those um, as your kind of um, your defense, right? So think about um, that as a um, as a, again, kind of a filter for what you would put out there. Um, I would encourage folks to Google themselves, um, set up maybe even a Google alert on yourself, um, on your name, so that you're able to sort of maintain that kind of critical eye going forward. Um, I would definitely on the what not to do side, I would avoid negatives, right? So I would avoid um, anger, profanity, complaining, all of those things probably are not going to aid in the development of your professional presence. Um, paying attention to grammar, spelling, things like that I mentioned before, not only are words important, but the images that you're posting or the images that you're tagged in, those are important to pay attention to. Um, and, you know, again, be uh, applying that critical eye towards um, not only what you're posting, but what you're reposting. Those kinds of things are important to pay attention to. Um, again, privacy settings, as we already mentioned, um, they're really important to set. Um, and depending on the platform, um, you may want to be more open or not. On LinkedIn, it might be more open. On Instagram, um, more of a, a closed um, kind of privacy um, approach that you're taking. Um, but also, as a reminder, just know that those privacy settings may not be foolproof. So again, just think about everything you're posting has the potential to be seen by an employer. Um, and then one last thing I would mention is just to ensure consistency um, in terms of how you're presenting yourself, the story that you're telling in a resume, in a cover letter, um, and other sources that it's matching up with what you're posting in social media, whether that's LinkedIn or, you know, Instagram. So you want to kind of build that, um, that brand, as Anita mentioned earlier, um, with an eye towards consistency too. So just those are some, some broad um, strokes around what we might um, recommend doing proactively on the offensive side and then taking a look at to be defensive about your social media activity too. Yeah, those, those are such good tangible tips. Um, and I think the, the um, one of the takeaways is start now. So even if you're not looking for an opportunity, um, you know, as you continue to use social media, always be thinking about the future um, and what that, that could mean. So that's great. Um, Stacey, we have talked so much about how we need to adapt and change in this COVID environment. Um, you know, let's put a different spin on it. What are some of the advantages that students can take away from this new kind of future of work? Yeah, I think that's important to just, you know, be positive at times and be realistic. And I think one of the positive outcomes has been for many of our students in the Baltimore sort of Richmond corridor, the increase in remote opportunities has opened up opportunities that seemed pretty much impossible pre-pandemic. 
So two years ago, a student who was in Richmond who wanted to work at Under Armour in Baltimore, that seemed pretty much impossible given 95, you know, whether it's 295, 395, 495, anything 95 just seemed like that that can't happen for you. Um, or even if a Baltimore student wanted to work at AWS in Herndon. Um, so now we have this opportunity where we're not limited by our geographic and transportation concerns. And so now that things are remote, these opportunities now seem very possible. And I think it's the perfect time to take advantage of these opportunities. Um, Again, I would encourage folks to just jump on these because we don't know how long they'll be available. You know, some people, some of these organizations may stay virtual or they may return back in person. And so, you know, if I'm in, if I'm in a school in Richmond, I'm definitely going to start opening up my scope in terms of my job search and my internship search. So I think that's important. Should, should a student be worried about the future? So if I'm going to take a full-time position in Baltimore, um, and I know that that's not sustainable if they go back in person. What kinds of things should I be talking to my employer about maybe during the interview process? Yeah, I think transparency. You know, I think many employers are, have indicated that or will indicate that on the job posting. They will say, you know, the expectation is that after COVID-19, that this position will be located in said city. Um, so I've seen that a lot now where they'll say this is 100% remote or opportunity for a remote work. So I think, and who knows, you may like the company so much that you are willing to relocate. You know, so don't, so don't not apply. Um, don't worry, I guess I'm thinking more like, don't worry about the future, worry about <laughs> now. And then when presented with that, uh, if it if it is sort of a mandate of now you need to come to Baltimore, you make the decision if you want to move. So I, I would say take advantage of it. But I think employers are very transparent right now in their job postings. And if they're not, then again, if you get to the interview stage, have ask that question. And I'm sure the employer will ask the same of you. That's great. Okay, so let's move to a lightning round um, and shift to some real practical applications students can take away on virtual interviewing. I know each one of you has mentioned it um, at some point this afternoon. So what are the top two pieces of advice you'd give to a student preparing for a virtual interview? And maybe we'll go Anita, Lori, Stacy. Sure, I would say prepare, prepare, prepare. I, you know, practice, do your mock interviews, practice some more, practice in the mirror, record yourself. Just make sure that you are ready because um, the visual facial cues are just so much more pronounced in a video interview. And so you want to make sure that you're in control of what's happening, you're in control of the environment as much as you can be. And then um, the second thing, I don't know whether it has to do necessarily with interviewing, but one thing I did want to mention is um, don't write off third party, you know, staffing agencies, especially if you're looking for a full time role. Um, the reputable agencies will not make the job seeker pay the employer pays the fee. But those agencies are experts in getting you ready to interview and helping you build a network. They know everybody in that or in that field in that industry and they can absolutely be helpful. So I did want to mention that as well. Great. Lori? Um, so I will echo the importance of preparation um, and maybe put a, a spin on it in terms of how you would prepare for an in-person interview should be the same. Um, you might do some extra, but the same as you would prepare for virtual interviews. So those two things in terms of preparation are, are going to be the same. So make sure, um, so I guess tip one would be make sure that you are doing your research. Um, so you want to be able to answer their questions. You want to be able to ask good, well-informed questions. So make sure you're researching the organization, the position, researching yourself. So you're able to articulate again, that value add in ways that are going to resonate with the employer. So that research piece is really important. Um, and then I'll also mention again, same thing that you would do if the interview was in person, uh, make sure you're following up afterwards. So sending that thank you, um, that continues to be important in this environment as well. 
And then I'll just jump in with some more just technical pieces, like make sure your internet connection is strong. Look at your bandwidth, sit as close as you can to the router if possible, hardwire if you need to, to make sure that you don't lose the connection. Um, I would say be on time. And so on time means be early, you know, make sure you log in, make sure you're connected, make sure there's no delays in your connection, uh, set your computer up test it beforehand with a family or a friend, you know, make sure that they can hear you, you can hear them. Uh, headphones if possible, set the computer up so that it's eye level, you know, so you're not looking down, it's not on your lap as you're interviewing. Those are just some technical pieces. And then obviously good lighting is also important. All of the things that we've learned over the last year, right? right. That we've been forced to learn. <laughs> This has been so wonderful. Um, I, I want to give an opportunity just to kind of, um, what, have, what have we missed? What are the highlights or, or key pieces that I haven't asked about today that um, you think sh students should know? And I'll just open it up to the entire group. So it's been mentioned before, but I will just put an additional plug in to connect with your career center. Um, folks, even if we're not there physically in person, and some of our offices may be open that way, but we are, are available um, in one way or the other to serve students, to support you during um, whatever career stage you're in. Um, so be sure to take advantage of that resource. Lots of online resources across all of our institutions, um, but of course the one-on-one the -on -one help coaching that you may be needing um, is gonna be available too. So, so be sure to take advantage of that resource. Yeah, and I will just emphasize what Lori said, I, I'm, I'm a thrifty person, so I always think about cost. And so, you know, uh, many of the services that your career center has are free. Um, once you get in the professional world and you have to pay for a career coach, it looks a lot different. Um, you know, you have to pay an hourly rate. Uh, but right now, these, these services are free to you all, so I would definitely recommend that. And then um, the other thing, I, Anita, thank you for mentioning that because I think that's important. I think a lot of times students uh, at the university level don't think about third party search firms, but they are very good at finding entry level opportunities for candidates, especially if you're in the arts or graphic design. Many of these uh, third parties are contracted with companies to seek out that type of talent. So definitely get in contact with your career center and they can maybe even refer you to some that are reputable in your area. And I think I would also add that as much as we do everything that we can to be helpful to our students and our alumni, we can't be your only source of career information. So, you, you know, we, it's impossible for us to convey to you every single opportunity that may fit you. And so you really need to take some of the onus and, you know, not just look at the university's job board, but also look at, you know, do a, a color to lamp list, do your 40 top employers and start looking at their websites and following them on LinkedIn, use LinkedIn jobs as a source to figure out what might be open and it might be a good fit. You know, so really diversifying where you're looking for these opportunities is just going to be helpful. And then finally, when you get an opportunity, could you just tell us Will you just let us know? Just let us know because it helps in so many ways. It helps with our data, but it also helps us build an alumni network because if one of our alums gets a job with a company and you're the first one in, then you can help the next person. And so that's what, that's what we'd like to see. Well, this has been such a fantastic panel. I know I've learned so much from all of you. So um, I, I know our participants have as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I just wanna put a plug in for the rest of the uh, Credential Month events. Again, you can go to the Credential Month tab on capitalcolab.com. We have some other exciting events happening throughout the month of April. So we hope you will join us. Um, and thank you again to our wonderful panelists.